So my presentation is on FBPAP, which is also known as fructose biphosphate aldolase phosphatase. This is a look into the evolutionary origins of a possible ancestral glucose design. And as you guys already know, my name is Vicky Raji. So first I want to talk a little bit about early life forms, which is, I guess, kind of an interesting transition considering the last presentation did comment on whether or not life originated somewhere else. But uh, as we know, originally life was microbial. It was single-celled organisms as life would develop on Mars. A long time ago though, there weren't many sugars because currently a lot of living organisms get sugars from other living organisms. For example, we eat animals, animals eat plants, and the plants uh, get a lot of nutrients and sugars from decomposing things. Also, much of early life was extremophilic because early Earth had very odd conditions, very different to what we know now. For example, it had very high temperatures. Additionally, it also had very low oxygen and high methane. So in general, early life functioned in an entirely different way as to how we do now. It's, I mean, similar because we're related, but a lot of its processes look very different. The lab I'm doing research for, the Desarmo lab, focuses a bit on the purple earth hypothesis, which is a theory that early life was not based around chlorophyll uh, photosynthesis, but instead retinal photosynthesis, which as you would see in the picture to the right would cause living organisms on mass to appear purple rather than green. Because while chlorophyll reflects green light, retinal absorbs green light and reflects purple. The interesting thing about this theory is that the sun transmits energy most in the green spectrum and gives off the most amount of energy there. Whereas chlorophyll absorbs in the blue and the red, which is odd because you'd think that life would adapt to start absorbing from the most energetic part of the energy we receive. So this implies that chlorophyll possibly evolved the organisms that had it evolved to pick up a wavelength that weren't already being absorbed which is possible that, poss that the organisms that originally had chlorophyll lived under a layer of other organisms that had retinal instead, which would cause the earth in general from far away to appear purple rather than green, thereby making the name of the theory, the purple earth hypothesis. Now, talking a little bit more about retinal, we know it's a protein and it's currently mostly found in halophiles, as we saw in the salt lake that was the picture in the previous slide. It absorbs light in the green wavelength spectrum, which gives it a purple appearance because it reflects that light that it doesn't absorb. An interesting fact is that it's not actually as efficient as chlorophyll, which would explain why chlorophyll is so much more prevalent nowadays. Some organisms do still use retinal photosynthesis, but it's certainly a lot more uncommon than chlorophyll. However, retinol does have a simpler structure, which would make it more likely to spontaneously occur and would make it easier to produce in a low oxygen environment because it takes less energy. The thing about the purple earth hypothesis is that it accounts for photosynthesis, but it doesn't cover all the corners of carbon fixation. So we're not entirely sure how early life fixed carbon and did so many things that are so vital for life, which is partially what I am trying to answer in my project. Now, talking a little bit more about carbon fixation, as we all know, it's generally the process of taking inorganic carbon and taking it into organic carbon or carbohydrates. As you see in the cycle to the side, that's generally how it works. And I would like to point out really quickly, one of the important parts of it is glyceraldehyde, which is something that my enzyme helps produce. Of course, glucose is a, the main organic starting material for other organic carbon compounds, which is why it's so important to living organisms and why all living organisms need to cut, take in and consume glucose in order to keep their energy. Therefore, a significant type of carbon fixation is gluconeogenesis, which is sort of like the reverse of glycolysis, which you might know as us taking sugars, glucose, and turning it into energy like ATP. Now, a little more on gluconeogenesis. As I mentioned before, it's like the opposite of glycolysis. So if glycolysis is taking glucose and making it into energy, 
uh, gluconeogenesis is making some is making the breakdowns of glucose into glucose. Now this makes it very important for early life because in a scenario where living organisms don't have sugars all over the place as we more or less have it now, it would be really important for the organisms to be able to synthesize sugar for themselves. And it would be a good way to get sugars without having to rely too much on the environment for them. The major substrates in gluconeogenesis are lactate, pyruvate, propionate, glycerol, and most amino acids. And you can see on the side here, the general path that it takes where glycolysis would be going down from glucose to pyruvate in order to make the energy. And instead we're taking pyruvate and making it into glucose. The enzyme I'm looking to, FBPAP, or as I already mentioned it, fructose biphosphate aldolase phosphatase is a very special enzyme because it has similarly high FBP aldolase and phosphatase activity. It's bifunctional. Originally, it was classified as a phosphatase because we saw in organisms that had very clear phosphatase activity, but the organisms that had it also showed very clear aldolase activity, which was incredibly odd because those organisms did not have a gene encoding for aldolase. And therefore we were able to figure out that instead there was this enzyme, this gene that coded or an, en an enzyme that did the activity of both, which made it seem like it was an aldolase and made it seem like it was a phosphatase. You can see the reactions I put here on the side of it catalyzing the reaction to make biphosphate, which is why it's called fructose biphosphate, aldolase phosphatase, into a glyceraldehyde and a dihydroxyacetone. And as well, we see it turning a biphosphate into a phosphate. So this gives it an important role in gluconeogenesis because it catalyzes the conversion of triose phosphate into fructose 6-phosphate. And as we see, it also helps create glyceraldehyde, which I noted on the carbon fixation slide is a very important part of that cycle. Going into a little bit more about why it's important, for one thing, it's very heat stable, which I think would make it a very good candidate for early life carbon fixation, because as we already mentioned, early earth had very high temperatures. So any enzymes that early life may have had would have to be able to survive high temperatures instead of unraveling or denaturalizing as many proteins that we know now do. Interestingly, it's mostly in archaea and only a bit in bacteria. And it takes the role of 3.1.3.11 in the pathway to the right, which you will see here is the gluconeogenesis pathway. It makes sugar degradation unnecessary, which is really good signs of conditions from early earth, because in, a, in an environment where there weren't many sugars, it would be important to be able to keep the ones that you already had, at least for as long as you can. I would love to point out in the pathway that the arrow for 3.1.3.11 is the only solid arrow with only one head to it, which is important, as I will mention later, in the unidirectionality of it. So generally, FBPAP is important because it helps to make fructose and glyceraldehyde, which is very important for simple sugars, which would be super helpful in carbon fixation for early life. So talking a little bit more about the unidirectionality, of the reaction FBPAP catalyzes. Let's discuss the enzyme meyerhoff parnas pathway, which is a pathway that, evolved, that allows metabolic use of glucose for ATP and NADH, which as we know is generally the energy that we use. So the importance of FBPAP possibly being the enzyme that allowed early life to do some of its carbon fixation is because if it is the ancestral enzyme, it implies that this pathway evolved in the direction of gluconeogenesis because it takes triose phosphate and makes it into a more stable fructose phosphate so that it won't change and it prevents the reaction from reversing, which of course implies that if it originally only went one way, then it evolved specifically for that direction and then later changed to go both ways. So generally talking a little bit more about my project, I am investigating FEPAP's evolutionary past to see how it got to where it is today, especially in its bifunctionality to see how it evolved to do both jobs. I also wanted to learn a little bit more about archaea and why certain organisms have it and others do not. 
because it's common in thermophilic archaea, but it does not show up in all of them, which is interesting and possibly a sign of gene loss. As well, originally I was very interested in thermophiles, which is why I started looking into this enzyme because I was intrigued by the fact that it was particularly heat stable. And I was wondering if it could be useful in other thermophilic organisms that we might find, for example, in, in higher temperature situations or in uh, extraterrestrial life, if we find similar enzymes there. So I'm, of course, doing this in the basic way. And the general outline of it would be taking the sequences from this enzyme of the organisms that we know have it and generally doing multiple sequence alignments, comparing it to the monofunctional enzymes and comparing them in groups and then all together. And then from here, I'm doing my phylogenetic analysis. And currently I'm in that stage of analyzing and researching for similarities and drawing my own personal conclusions based on the trees and tables that I've currently made. Overall, in summary, I wanted to talk a bit more about why I find this so important. For one thing, I'm trying to learn more about early life and the ancestral ways that we used to do things. And I want to learn more about the beginnings of carbon fixation because currently we know a lot about how we do it now, but we don't entirely know what preceded these processes. And we don't have a lot of answers for how the original life forms may have completed these processes that are so important to how we survive today. And I really wanted to learn more about that. As well, I wanted to explain some chemical behaviors of certain microbes as to why, as I mentioned before, some organisms have it and others that you would expect to have it don't. And some organisms have it, have this enzyme twice. And we're not entirely sure why. Also throughout the process of the project, I became very interested in the bifunctionality of it and how something becomes bifunctional, how it came to be and whether it evolved from the monofunctional enzymes or whether the monofunctional enzymes evolved from it. So in general, I think that's very interesting and partially why I'm looking into FTPAP. And that's generally my presentation. Any questions? Awesome, great job, Vicky. Uh, I see some claps coming in from the reactions. Uh, if there's any questions, you can drop them in the chat or go ahead and raise your hand. I see Sanjoy right away again has a question. Vicky, thank you very much for, for your presentation. Um, I, I was uh, curious about the fact that, like you mentioned, during the early Earth, there was essentially very low to no oxygen in the atmosphere, which means that there was no ozone layer, which means that uh, the planet had no protection against UV. And mm -hmm. So I guess it makes sense that or, uh, that early life close to the surface of the water or on uh, you know, primordial land would have had pigments to protect themselves against UV. And so in that sense, like the purple earth is consistent with that. Um, but UV is really damaging and could really push evolution in a way that um, would be rather evolution response to environmental stress. So I'm wondering if you have thought about the effects of UV in, in the stability of FDPAP and its evolution uh, over time. That's an interesting point. I actually, I haven't thought about that, but that certainly is intriguing. I do know, as I already mentioned, FDPAP is a pretty sturdy enzyme, uh, but also it's much less common now than it would have been if it is the ancestral enzyme. So it's possible that it was damaged over time and I guess mutated because of so many UVs uh, rays that, that made it kind of change and turn into the other kinds of enzymes that do that job today. Mm -hmm.